We're here in Birmingham's Museum and Art Gallery today to talk about Rococo and neoclassical painting. Whereas Rococo was the last style of the French monarchy, neoclassicism was the first style of the new French Republic. Now, the Rococo borrowed many of its techniques and forms from the Baroque. It used a tonal type of painting, soft edges, and luscious color. If Baroque painting treated serious and noble issues from the Bible and classical literature, Rococo art was quite different. It looked to a more private and refined emotional experience. It was full of sensuous delight. It was about love. Rococo is a French style, and it's really synonymous with the, the reign of Louis XV. It comes out of the Baroque style, but where the Baroque in the 17th century was a very dynamic movement, when we come to the 18th century in the Rococo, it takes this dynamism from that earlier period and refines it rather into delicate swirls and little curling designs feathery patterns. So it's a much more elegant style, rather, rather more a court style than, than the earlier work. The point about the Rococo, I think, is that it actually shows a hedonistic lifestyle, an enjoyable lifestyle. Um, and many people who had made their fortunes invested in this kind of style as well, because it wasn't heavy, it was the kind of style that you could live with and it celebrated life. The word Rococo doesn't really have a precise meaning, which relates very well to the type of art which was produced during this period. However, the, the word Rococo does have a precise origin. Its origins lie in the word rocai, which was a word used to, used to describe a type of decoration using shells. This was used to decorate kind of architectural features of French palaces, French country houses. The art that was produced during this period, like its name suggests, was quite ambiguous. It was concerned with kind of lots of different types of ideas. With an emphasis on decoration, a lot of the images produced during this period seemed to be quite frivolous, with an emphasis on froth and fluff and hearts and cupids. The term Rococo was soon used generally to describe a style of architecture, painting, sculpture, interior design, and even music. In painting especially, the works of the Rococo age present us with an idealized world of pleasure, a feminized world of romantic love, music, and human figures in dreamlike poses, living as it were without a care in the world. This painting, intended for the shopfront decoration of the actual premises depicted in the work, is called L'Enseigne de Garçon. It depicts the premises of a fashionable art dealer of the time, a room full of fashionably dressed patrons. It is one of the last great works of a painter regarded as the true great of the age of the Rococo, Jean-Antoine Watteau. Born in 1684 in Flanders, Watteau moved to Paris at 18 to make a living as an artist. In succeeding in his aim, he painted images that define the Rococo spirit in art. Influenced by the great Flemish artist Rubens and the great Venetian artists like Titian and Giorgione, Watteau's fame rests on his so-called Fête Galant, paintings which depict outdoor scenes in which ladies and gentlemen of society pass their time away in beautiful gardens and landscapes. Individuals whose only worries, if any, concern the ever-important business of love. Fête in a Park, one such scene produced in 1719, provides a wonderful example of Watteau's approach. In all of Watteau's paintings, there is a kind of amorous instinct. And in something like a Fête in a Park, we observe 
the kind of courting process going on. So we have couples trying to entertain each other and also pair off. In lots of Votto's paintings, if you like, this, this pairing off instinct is, is very prominent. What we also find in a lot of Votto's paintings is that we see statues. Now these, these statues very often seem very alive. Uh, particularly in the Fate in a Park, the statue is roused. And very often these statues give us the idea that love is progressing. So if the statue is sleeping, there's some problem going on. But if the statue is awake, awakened, then th the process of love can carry on. The curious thing about Vato, which makes him different from the other Rococo painters, painters like Boucher and Fragonard and Lancre, is that Louis XV's style, Louis XV's period, was one in which the elite lived such a rarefied life that they had so much done for them that all they had to do was uh, live this very much more grandiose life than had hitherto known. The problem with that, which Watteau was able to show, was that it then becomes rather an aimless life because there's nothing to strive for in life. And the people that we see in the painting, they spend all of their days dressing up, living this life, playing in the park. But there's a strange sense of aimlessness. They have a kind of a sense that they're going nowhere. And where the other painters of that period could only see the surface, could only see the surface glitter. Vato was able to show us that there was another side to what appeared to be a perfect life. Watteau's Fet Venetien provides another memorable painting of gay, carefree life and includes amongst its fashionable figures a bagpipe player. Musicians featured in many of Watteau's finest works, along with clowns, but in his true masterpiece, The Departure from the Island of Scythera, it is love and lovers that provide the subject matter. Scythera is itself the mythological island of eternal love. Here we see a procession of individuals about to depart from the island after, one can only assume, a day of hazy sunshine, romance and music. It's difficult to experience anything other than a sense of sheer idealized pleasure in a Watteau such as this, although some critics feel he also succeeds in capturing a sense of melancholy, perhaps. A sadness at the inevitable passing of time, which cannot be avoided even in a setting such as this. Perhaps Watteau himself knew that he did not have long to live. Four years after creating this image, he died of tuberculosis at the age of 37. Despite Watteau's early death, the spirit of Rococo painting lived on in France, as can be seen clearly in the works of Francois Boucher, born a generation after Watteau and heavily influenced by him. Highly successful in his lifetime, Boucher became the favored artist of the famous Madame de Pompadour, the powerfully influential mistress of the Sun King's successor, Louis XV. He painted her portrait on at least eight occasions and her influence led to Boucher eventually becoming the official painter to the French king. Women would provide the subject matter for Boucher's greatest Rococo paintings, and his love of the nude can be seen time and time again. Boucher's nudes are always warm and sensuous, with the artist's mastery of painting flesh readily visible in such works as Diana After the Hunt and The Reclining Girl. The first of these paintings represents a goddess from mythology, while the latter is almost certainly an image of one of Louis XV's other mistresses. But who the women are actually supposed to be as individuals does not perhaps matter to Boucher. It's the idealized curves of the flesh and the even voluptuous quality of these nudes, set in soft, sweet luxury, that draws the viewer towards the picture. In Cupid and a Captain, from 1754, we see these themes once more, 
It's difficult not to think of a rose when one considers the pink used by Boucher to depict this scene of fantasy, the capture of the sun of Venus. But Cupid would rarely be a captive in the art of the Rococo. Love and sensuous pleasures were never far away in the works of the finest artists working in this style. In French Rococo, perhaps the idea of love was never depicted more memorably than in The Swing, a painting by Jean Honor Fragonard from 1769. With The Swing, in terms of composition, it typifies the Rococo period as there is an emphasis on fluidity of movement, fluidity of line. The dress in Fragonard's swing is particularly important because he is concerned with materiality. He's concerned with emphasising the tactile qualities of the material, with, all, with, the, with the frilliness of it, the size of it, the, the sort of layers of underskirt and the colours of the dress relate well to the slightly naughty theme of the swing with the gentleman looking at the lady's skirt. A painting like the swing is almost theatrical in its effect. It's difficult to see the figures depicted as being anything other than actors, an approach which Fragonard may have learnt during his early career in Italy when he came under the influence of the great Italian artist of the Rococo age, Giovanni Tiepolo. Born in 1696, it's perhaps unsurprising that Tiepolo hailed from Venice, home of the great Giorgione. Like the French Rococo masters, Tiepolo created a colorful, indulgent world of near make-believe. In his Banquet of Antony and Cleopatra, a fresco at the Palazzo Labia in Venice, we can perhaps see in the image of Cleopatra the approach of Boucher. She is a woman first, and a queen second. It was the overall effect of the fresco that mattered more to Tiepolo. It's important to emphasize Tiepolo's influence in the development of European Rococo. Not only did he influence Fragonard and thus the French tradition, but in 1750, he traveled to Germany to work on the residence of the ruling Prince Bishop at Würzburg. The palace itself represents the highest achievement in German Rococo architecture, but it is indoors that Tiepolo created his masterpiece, decorating the Kaiser Hall, the Imperial Salon. This room is perhaps the ultimate Rococo experience. Tiepolo was commissioned to fresco scenes from German history but he brought to his work the same approach he had adopted back in Venice. In one of the scenes, the marriage of Frederick of Barbarossa and Beatrice of Burgundy, the viewer is left in little doubt that it is the bride and not the groom who is the star of the glittering wedding scene. Perhaps more than any other period in art history, Rococo paid little more than lip service to the kind of muscular masculinity best rendered in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Rococo art, with its emphasis on private inner emotion, produced few monumental public buildings. Baroque monumentality, after all, was no longer the fashion. More typical is the attempt to add small touches of pleasure to the city of Paris. Typical of this is the Fountain of the Four Seasons, a little space of respite that keeps its politics low-key. This is the Fountain of the Four Seasons, commissioned by Louis XV. It's a much less grand affair with much less political rhetoric in it than the work made by his father, such as the Louvre. It's more domestic, smaller in scale, here on a quiet Paris side street. While its proportions are smaller and more intimate, so too we see the theme of the Four Seasons. In one tableau, we see summer, with babies wearing garlands, playing in the field. For autumn, we see the harvest. In winter, it's winemaking. And in the spring, we see them fanning the flames and bringing warmth to the new season. It's much less aggressive in its political statements. And indeed, during this time, Europe was blessed with almost 80 years of peace. 
By 1574, after Tieplo had completed his work at the Kaiser Hall, the Rococo spirit was beginning to fade. Even in the first half of the 18th century, with Rococo at its height, not all artists were concerned with creating ornate decorative fantasies. And with the work of Jean-Baptiste Chardin, we can see the beginnings of a different approach to painting. Aristocratic fantasy was giving way to a more realist and moralist style. Born in 1699, Chardin's paintings could hardly be more different in approach to the extravagances of the Rococo. Dutch art, particularly the art of someone like Vermeer, has a huge influence on Chardin in terms of subject matter and style. Chardin's kitchen maid seems to be a humble scene of domesticity. However, what is very interesting about this parallel is that Dutch painters such as Vermeer, they were painting specifically for a merchant class. This can be seen as a parallel with French society at this time, which was experiencing a type of boom, which allowed the bourgeoisie and the courtly class to really become immersed in art and culture. So a painting such as Chardin's The Kitchen Maid would appeal very nicely to this type of buying public with its emphasis on goods, its emphasis on surface detail and its accessible quality. With another of Chardin's most significant paintings, however, we can begin to see a new direction of subject matter and theme. In his painting, Grace at Table, of 1740, Chardin depicts a mother with her two daughters about to eat. Chardin saying Grace is painted in 1740. He actually presents it to the king, King Louis XV, and he also presents another one of his paintings uh, to Louis at the same time. Louis likes them so much that he keeps them in his personal study. Now, in the 18th century, the status of still life painting was quite low, but Chardin greatly improves the status because of his extremely exquisite and careful compositions. Um, Chardin is always called a kind of painter's painter because of the problems of organisation and colour harmonies that he solves in his work. Saying Grace is a humble domestic scene. What we've got is the, the mother ladling out the meal with her two children seated at the table. The younger of the two children is stumbling over the words of Grace. And you can see that the older child is looking down with some kind of pleasure at the discomfort that the child, younger child has about speaking the words of the grace. It's terrifically observed as well, because if you look at the red hands of the mother, it's clear that she's just been exposed to heat and the, the hands have got red by working in the kitchen. And there are lots of extra details that add to our information about the painting as well. There's a child's toy drum on the back of the chair. His use of handling the paint creates a kind of material quality in the objects he produces so that they seem almost irresistibly real to us. The painting, uh, uh, saying Grace, on the surface appears rather uh, almost as a sentimental painting. But it's this quality of being able to portray all of the materials and the small still life on the table, which takes it out of that sense of sentimentality. Chardin always said that he painted not only with colours, he also painted with feeling. And one of the most famous critics of the day, a man called Diderot, called Chardin a magician for his ability to conjure up these very believable and very poignant still lives. There's also a clear message in the painting. There can be no doubting Chardin's enthusiasm for the ritual of grace, and indeed he uses this painting to express his principles. There is more than a hint of moral instruction about this image, and in his Toilette du Matin, the sense of moral teaching is perhaps even more striking. Stimulated by artists and writers, a new sense of moral seriousness would influence European attitudes in the mid-18th century. In France, this moral approach can perhaps be best seen in the genre paintings of Jean-Baptiste Greuze 
an artist born in 1725, whose work satisfied the newfound enthusiasm for seriousness. Though the whole canvas may seem somewhat contrived to the modern viewer, images like these proved extremely popular in the newfound moral sensibilities of the day. Perhaps more than any other French artist of the age, Greuze was a widely popular artist with a moral message that could be readily understood by the public. This was an approach that had already been taken up by an artist in England, possibly the first great English painter, but certainly not the last, as we shall see. He was a man whose creations remain well known and well loved to this day, William Hogarth. Born in 1697, Hogarth, like Greuze, would become extremely popular with the public of his day. From an early age, this was Hogarth's express intention. To achieve his aim, he chose a new approach in subject matter, the mocking humor of satire. It was a sensible decision. Here we are at Birmingham's Museum and Art Gallery to have a look at one of the finest paintings by Hogarth, the final scene of the Beggar's Opera. During the Baroque period, painters in England had a rather difficult time. There were limited commissions from both the church and the state. However, in the Rococo period, the artist Hogarth found a new way to make paintings. He turned instead to the market for prints and engravings, making paintings that would then be sold in the popular market. This meant that he could do things like tell stories, make satires of social manners, without having to worry about what his patrons would say. Hogarth took advantage of the great British love for the theatre, and here he's developed a style specifically for telling stories. Indeed, he presents us with a stage space, its backdrop and floorboards, and the characters clearly placed in the foreground. The style is soft-edged, typical of the Rococo painting in France at the time. The early 18th century was a truly golden age of English language satire. With the writings of men such as Alexander Pope, Henry Fielding, and greatest of them all, Jonathan Swift, the creator of Gulliver's Travels. It was a time when the hypocrisies and contradictions of the day were brilliantly revealed in the written word, in the Enlightenment spirit. Hogarth became a master of visual satire, and he succeeded in painting images, not only amusing, but shot through with moral tone as well. With his famous Marriage a la Mode from 1745, we can gain a flavor of Hogarth's highly original approach. Hogarth's Marriage a la Mode can be seen as a didactic piece of art. Its didactic nature is emphasized by the fact that it is a narrative based on a series of six paintings which run in sequence. In the six paintings, Hogarth tells the story of the downfall of an arranged marriage between the son of a man of means, a man of means who was greedy and miserly, and a girl from a lower class. Hogarth is, in his satirical work, is concerned with the false nature of such alliances and man's transparency. Hogarth goes through the various stages of the marriage and eventually this marriage reaches a terrible climax. But the terrible climax is important in teaching the viewer a lesson, which is what Hogarth was concerned with doing. Hogarth's intention was to reach as wide as possible an audience. To achieve this, he issued engravings of the Marriage a la Mode series, which proved extremely popular with the public as had the engravings from an earlier and perhaps even better known satirical series, The Rake's Progress. With The Rake's Progress, completed in 1735, Hogarth sought to illustrate the inevitable consequences of a reckless, feckless existence, the life of a rake. Over the course of eight paintings, we follow the life of a wealthy young man, as he squanders his inheritance through gambling and intemperance. Not even marriage for money to an older woman can save him from the ruin 
which his lack of virtue brings upon him. By the time we reach the last painting in the series, the story's protagonist is abandoned by his wealthy friends and reduced to a lunatic asylum, London's notorious Bedlam. It is perhaps this final image of the series that gives us the clearest insight into the artist's ability to mix the Rococo style with high moral purpose. Hogarth was the great social commentator of the 1730s. From 1730 on, 31 onwards, he painted a sequence of so-called modern moralities that were looking at contemporary issues and being slightly satirical about the state of England at the time. The Rake's progress is all about uh, a young heir, Thomas Rakewell, who inherits his father's money and then proceeds to spend it on debauchery and vice. There are eight scenes in the Rake's Progress, and the last one is the Rake in Bedlam. Now, Bedlam was the mental institution at this time, and you can see the Rake naked writhing around in the foreground. At this time, there was no sympathetic treatment for the mad. Uh, in very many cases, the mad were not even given clothes because it was thought that they would just tear them up or soil them. And this is actually the Rake dying. So after being uh, imprisoned for debt and losing all his money, he finally goes mad. And if you like, this death struggle shows a kind of release from the torment of life. What you can also see in the painting is you can see Sarah Young, who was his jilted fiancée, that she stayed faithful to him throughout all of his escapades. We can also see comic interludes of the other inmates of the asylum. So there's a false king who's got his own crown and scepter. He's actually urinating in the corner of his cell. Um, you've got a religious fanatic there, and you've got uh, a would-be astronomer with a rolled-up telescope. But what's also interesting in the painting is that you've got two visitors. At this time, you could pay tuppence and go and walk around the wards of Bedlam. So we've got a lady of quality and also her servant who are looking at the insane, and they're very amused by the king who's urinating. All of Hogarth's uh, work became, in fact, so popular that the engravings, for example, began to be pirated. And what he did to overcome this was begin the Copyright Act, so that in 1735 uh, the Copyright Act was brought out specifically to protect uh, the rights of people who produced engravings and written documentation. Hogarth's fame is based so much on these popular picture series that it's easy to forget his consummate skill as a conventional portraitist. This is unfortunate, since portraits such as his rendition of the great actor David Garrick as Richard III and the Shrimp Girl provide the modern viewer with superbly executed images of the characters of mid-18th century England. Perhaps these portraits have suffered relative neglect because of the work of two great artists born a generation after Hogarth, two men whose portraiture is amongst the greatest art ever produced in England, Sir Joshua Reynolds and Thomas Gainsborough. Born in 1727 in Suffolk, Thomas Gainsborough rose from humble beginnings to become a truly great landscape painter and one of the best known portraitists of his age. By the end of his life in 1788, he'd painted over 200 portraits of royalty and nobility, as well as London's literary society. This depiction of the wife of the dramatist Richard Sheridan from late in the artist's career shows a charming, elegant and graceful woman sitting in a beautiful landscape. Of all Gainsborough's 200 portraits, however, one image, more than any, is associated with his work, an image familiar to people with only a passing interest in art. Painted around the same time as Miss Haverfield of 1780, it is an image of a young man which remains one of the most memorable in the history of English art, the Blue Boy. So in 1770, Gainsborough paints the Blue Boy. The sitter is Jonathan Buttle, the son of a Soho ironmonger. It's very likely that Gainsborough paints this work for his own amusement because he reuses a canvas. 
X-rays have shown that underneath the blue boy, there is another painting of an older man. Uh, you wouldn't usually reuse a canvas for a brand new commission. What Gainsborough is very keen to do in his technique is to show opulence and fine clothes. We know that Gainsborough used very long brushes and he thinned down his paint to a, a, an extreme level. So he uses long brushes at a great distance away from the, the canvas. And so when you get close to a Gainsborough, the, the marks seem almost meaningless. It's when you get back from them that these marks fall into place in a kind of magical way. And even Reynolds, his great rival, had to admit that there was a supremely decorative effect when you stood back from these works. As a painter, he had a vision that an artist could produce images which were unique, rather different from the, the norm. One of the main ideas that directed the way how painting was supposed to be produced was this notion of aerial perspective, which had come all the way down from Leonardo. And that idea was that colours should recede into the distance and move from warm colours to cool colours, so that all of the colours in the foreground would be warm colours, and all of those that we see in the background would be cool colours, blues and greens. And the blue boy is in fact the complete reverse. Here we have a, a boy who stands four square in the middle of the canvas, and he wears a bright blue outfit, which should be the colour for the background. And all of the background, all of this, is warm browns, oranges. Now, an old le legend says that Gainsborough painted the blue boy as a piece of rivalry with Reynolds. Reynolds is supposed to have said that blue should never be the predominant colour in a painting, and Gainsborough did this despite him. There's probably no truth in this, but we know that Reynolds painted a so-called brown boy earlier on. It's very likely that Gainsborough painted his own bl blue boy in rivalry to Reynolds' brown boy. Though the artistic output of Sir Joshua Reynolds may not have included a work as famous as the blue boy, there is no doubting his importance in the history of art, while his eventual knighthood gives a clue to the unprecedented status he achieved in his lifetime. Born in 1723, his achievements were formidable. A painter of over 2,000 portraits, he also lectured and wrote extensively on art theory. He became the first president of the Royal Academy in 1768. Four years earlier, he founded the Literary Club alongside figures such as Dr. Johnson and James Boswell, in addition to David Garrick and Richard Sheridan, before becoming painter in ordinary to King George III. Reynolds' activity with the Royal Academy seemed to cement his belief in this grand manner, this belief that art should be an intellectual pursuit, art shouldn't have anything to do with craft or production or handiwork. For Reynolds, there could be no separation between art and intellect. He was inspired by Italy, he was inspired by the classical tradition and the classical tradition of history painting. In his portrait of Joseph Baretti, the figure is engrossed in thought. He is an intellectual. Joseph Baretti doesn't look directly at the viewer. He is engrossed in what he's reading. He's entirely focused on this intellectual pursuit. But for Reynolds, everything must come back to the general and to the ideal. There's no space for individuality or anything that detracts from this intellectual superiority. But for sheer sentiment in portraiture, one must surely turn to a work created by Reynolds only two years later, a canvas depicting a girl of about four, Miss Bowles and her dog. The story goes that Reynolds visited the little girl the day before he was to paint her, spending the day with her, telling her stories and playing games. The next day, Miss Bowles was so overjoyed to see the artist again that the tedious business of sitting still for the portrait 
became a pleasure for her. The joy in the girl's face as she hugs her beloved dog would seem to confirm this well-known tale. Hogarth, Gainsborough, and Reynolds can be seen as the first great English artists, and at the time they produced their finest works, England was beginning to exert a greater cultural influence in continental Europe, most notably after the great French writer Voltaire published his Philosophical Letters on the English. English developments in science and literature grew to be widely admired, as did the nation's steady progress in social reform. In art, the English were admired for their informality and for their love of nature. By the time of Reynolds' greatest portraits, though, many younger artists were actively pursuing a new approach inspired by the ancient past. This was called Neoclassicism, and although the Neoclassicists started in Rome, the greatest of them would be a Frenchman, a Frenchman who would become intimately involved with a revolution that would announce the start of the modern age. Rococo painting became a much more relaxed style. It was private, it was seductive, full of sensuous color, very often treating matters of love. All of this was to change, however, with the fall of the aristocracy and the arrival of the new French Republic and the Revolution. Neoclassicism was again a more serious style of history painting, showing the heroes of the French Republic and their values of the new French state. As a style, neoclassicism had a very restrained and exacting handling of paint. It used a crisp, linear style. It had reduced color. It tended to be an intellectual rather than an emotional style of art. And it often used well-defined forms against a very shallow space, very much like Roman and Greek low-relief sculpture. Neoclassicism can be traced to the discoveries of the ruins of Herculaneum and Pompeii in the first half of the 18th century, alongside the contemporary rediscovery of the architecture of ancient Greece. In the 1760s, a group of artists formed in Rome under the German art historian Jan von Winkelmann, who reacted against the ornamentation of Rococo art. Instead, they sought a new, simpler approach to their art, inspired by what their leaders called the noble simplicity and calm grandeur of ancient art. In 1774, a young artist arrived in Rome as winner of the prestigious Prix de Rome, a prize which enabled him to spend several years studying classical art. His name was Jacques-Louis David. David was concerned with introducing a new austerity to art. His style and subject matter could not be further removed from the style and subject matter of the Rococo. David was concerned with austerity in terms of emotion and in terms of intellect. David's Oath of the Horatii epitomises this return to classical ideals, classical ideals in terms of style, but also classical ideals in terms of subject matter. The Oath of the Horatii uses a classical subject matter which is concerned with fighting for the common good and personal sacrifice to comment on the political situation in France at the time. He is here mainly concerned with the idea of an oath, the idea of allegiance to one cause, and he uses austere, rigid, classical gesture, classical pose to allow everything to be focused on one idea. He relied on the harmony and balance and cleanness of neoclassicism to put across an almost harsh message of staunch resoluteness to a collective need. It would be these themes that would make the neoclassicist style the official art style of the French Revolution. 
by then just four years away. David would be the artist most closely connected with that turbulent event. The late 18th century, of course, saw revolution not only in Europe. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 initiated revolutionary change across the Atlantic, leading eventually to a fully independent United States. But even before the 1776 Declaration, America had produced its first memorable artist, John Singleton Copley, a Bostonian originally influenced by the Rococo style. It would be in Europe, however, that Copley would find fame. In 1775, at the suggestion of Reynolds, who admired his work, Copley moved to London and became a member of the Royal Academy. One work of Copley's from the following decade is especially significant. Having taken up history painting, in 1785 he painted his image of one of the most dramatic moments in British political history. The title of the painting says it all, Charles I demanding the surrender of the five impeached members of the House of Commons, 1641. Now, in 1641, Charles I sent a message to Parliament saying that he wanted the five members accused of treason delivered to him. There was no reply, and so he went personally to the House of Commons and demanded from the Speaker to know if these members were in the chamber or not. And the Speaker, Lentil, gave the immortal reply, I have, sir, neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as the House is pleased to direct me, whose servant I am here. So this opposition to the king led to the English Civil War. We see in the painting, Charles I in the centre, the speaker Lentil is on his knees delivering this proclamation. And just behind Lentil, we see Oliver Cromwell. So there's obviously a link there between the future action of the English Civil War. We know that Copley goes to a huge amount of research. There are something like 58 different portraits in this painting. And in fact, when Copley produced this painting, he specifically tried to find out from the actual records and from people who'd had accounts given to them exactly what had happened, who stood where, so that he could produce a picture which was almost like a, a recreation of the scene in this rather dramatic historical fashion. Four years after Copley's great work was exhibited in London, across the Channel it became France's turn to rise up against its monarchy and revolution. In the aftermath of the cataclysmic political events of 1789, the creator of the Oath of the Horatii became deeply involved with Robespierre, Danton, Marat, and the other leaders of the early revolution. But as revolution descended into terror, a political murder took place in 1793, which provides the subject for perhaps the most famous painting from Jacques-Louis David, The Death of Mara. Mara was a radical politician, and his extreme policies eventually led to the terror, the purging of all hostile elements to the revolution in France. He's assassinated in 1793 by a moderate, a woman called Charlotte Corday. She decides he's a dangerous fanatic who's hijacked the revolution, so he has to be removed. She inveigles her way into his apartment and stabs him with a kitchen knife. It's important when you look at this painting to realise that this is not the dead Mara, but this is the dying Mara. And David uses all of the references of religious painting to suggest that this is not just a dying politician, but this is a dying martyr. We're also invited to think that Charlotte Corday is only a few steps away from us. I feel like she's just out of frame. Because on the floor, there's a knife. Now, we know that that knife had a black handle, but David changes it to a white bone handle. So therefore, you can see the murderous traces of Charlotte Corday. And it's a very restrained picture. He's, uh, David's cut out all of the periphery 
so that we see a very blank wall. We see a very restricted perspective. Everything is rather straight up in front of us. And Mara's arm lies down onto the floor. Mara had a skin disease, so he's forced to work at home in his bath. He used a packing case as a work surface. And David shows us that packing case and inscribes on it the words Amara David. So to Mara from David. As a kind of memorial and as a tombstone. And we know that David and the other revolutionaries of the time meant this to be a kind of republican altarpiece. People were meant to come and look at this to show how a virtuous death could benefit the revolution. Perhaps it is fitting, then, to conclude the story of 18th century art with a tomb. In 1792, the French Republic sought a new style, a neoclassical style in architecture, to house the remains of the heroes of the French Revolution. The smooth, sparse walls and replica of a Roman temple front made the Pantheon in Paris strike a rationalist, anti-Rococo note that made it highly suitable to such a secular monument. This is the Pantheon, right in the center of Paris. It was designed in 1755 by the architect Soufflot, and it was the first attempt at making a building in the neoclassical style. They liked this style because of its calm sense of grandeur, its simplicity of design. You can see the triangular pediment at the top and the fantastic collection and arrangement of columns below it. It's very much like the front of a Greek classical temple. Originally, it was designed as a church, but during the revolution, it was secularized. Many of the great men of the revolution are in fact buried here, including Mirabeau, Rousseau, and even Voltaire. David's influence would extend beyond the revolution into the Napoleonic era which followed, as would the close relationship between the arts and the French state, whether it be republic or monarchy. He would prove a significant influence on the next generation of painters in France and beyond, as we shall see in the next program on the Romantics. Though an age of great contrasts, of sensuous pleasures and austere discipline, the 18th century was still an age which produced many remarkable landmarks in Western art.